All right, so today we are going to talk about stratification. And if perhaps you have some environmental science um, or geology or geography under your belt, uh, the word stratification might seem a little familiar to you. And that's because you might think of it as the sort of division of, say, the Earth in various layers, uh, crust, mantle, core, etc. Um, and, and it's pretty much that way we think about it in society. Basically, we are dividing society up into layers, and here's how we do it. So, social stratification is society's categorization into rankings. It's basically there is a ladder and we all fall somewhere on that ladder, on that hierarchy of society. And here, typically, we see social stratification as happening along lines of wealth, income, race, all sorts of different factors. Commonly, we think of our social stratification system as being mainly on economic levels. So let's explain the difference between wealth and income. Wealth is the total net value a person has. So that includes income, which is just a person's wages and perhaps dividends that they get from things like stocks and bonds. But wealth also includes things like any kind of property owned, intellectual property, as well as physical property. All of that stuff comes together to form a person's wealth. Now, we are a part of a stratification system and, and different societies are structured in different ways. And one sort of difference that we can see between societies and their forms of stratification is in whether or not there is the ability for movement within these systems of stratification. So in closed systems, there is no social mobility. There's very little or none at all. If you are born into a particular layer, a particular place on that ladder, um, a particular position in that hierarchy, you have very little hope of moving anywhere within that structure. You don't really shift in levels, and in some cases there is barely any interaction between the differing levels within this particular system. On the other hand, something that might be more familiar is our society, which is more of an open system. Usually these are based on achievement uh, rather than sort of ascribed status, right? Remember that from, from a couple of weeks ago. And there is definitely a lot more ability for movement within these societies. That's why they're called open, right? So there's an ability for you to be perhaps born in one particular point in the ladder, but you can move up or down depending on different social factors. The most common, um, sort of commonly cited closed system would be the caste system, which was uh, predominant in India. It's not as predominant anymore, but it is a sort of classic example of a closed system. Within this system, you are born into a particular social standing and you stay there. And every single aspect of your social positioning is based on your particular caste. So these things include both your work prospects, um, the kinds of people you can marry, and usually people are socialized into accepting their point within this caste, right? Because there is this idea of predetermination, you are fated to be in that caste because of perhaps maybe um, the, the way you lived your life in a previous life, right? And then perhaps if you do really well in this particular existence, you may move on, you may move up in the ranks, um, perhaps in a next life, right? So there is this idea of fate and destiny and the will of a higher power that makes it so that people can be socialized into accepting that they are born into where they're born into and they're stuck there. Our system, on the other hand, is more of a class system. And these are based both on social factors, our ascribed status, if you will, as well as individual achievements. So what is a class? A class of people, it's a group of people, who share similar status in terms of wealth, income, education, and occupation. 
So um, we will sort of break these down in, in a little bit in terms of the way that we think of ourselves um, as sort of being upper class, middle class, lower class, etc. Um, but generally, and with, with some exceptions, the people that reside in a particular class could be seen to have similar wealth, income, levels of education, as well as, as kinds of occupations. Now, instead of the caste system, where you're pretty much stuck working and marrying um, whoever it is that shares that caste with you, in a class system, you can form families and your marriages from within your particular class or from the outside. So what are the differences? Um, you can have exogamous marriages, whereas where you marry somebody that is outside your social category. And an easy way to sort of remember this is, you know, exogamous. Think of it as exiting your social category, perhaps through marriage. Or endogamous, which is where you marry within your social category. So think of endogamous as being within your particular class. Um, sometimes people actually use this idea of exogamous and endogamous marriage as a strategic point to move up or down um, within their particular social categories. So, ideally, <laughs> and of course this is ideal, um, ideally people sort of think of the system that, that we're in as, as being strictly a meritocracy. Um, you might have sort of described, you might have heard America being described as a meritocracy, where it is solely your personal effort or merit. How hard you work is the thing that determines where your social standing is. Um, we do not have a meritocracy here necessarily, as much as many people would like to cite America as a prime example of one, uh, because there are other social factors other than individual effort that go into a person's particular social standing. So this is an ideal that people express. It does not necessarily happen in reality. So what are some of the factors that kind of go into thinking about class and, and stratification and where we are is whether or not there is consistency in an individual's rank across factors, and that is called status consistency. If you have a high consistency in things like your race, um, other points of status like your wealth and your income, etc., um, then you might see that there is sort of less chance of mobility. If there is lower consistency, then there is more opportunity for you because you are sort of flexible. So take, take, um, take a, a person who goes to high school, right, um, but then doesn't necessarily go to college. Uh, that would be a trait that might be fitting for someone of perhaps a lower middle or perhaps lower class. Um, they perhaps start a company where they have, I don't know, perhaps they, they open up a store and they, and they start a small business. Starting a small business would be consistent with someone that is perhaps uh, of a middle class upbringing. Um, if, that, if that small business um, has to do with, say, manual labor, some people might think that that would be consistent of a person that would be of a lower class. On the other hand, if that business is very, very successful and it creates someone's income to the point that they have high wealth and high income due to this small business, then that would be consistent with somebody of an upper class, right? So upper middle class person. So then there are a lot of inconsistencies there. Um, they went to high school, didn't necessarily go to college, but at the same time they started a small business, but the small business dealt in manual labor. However, they are so successful that they have the wealth and income of somebody that is maybe upper class, right? So it is possible for somebody to be incredibly non-consistent in their status and find success. 
If you have a low consistency, then perhaps this is the person that goes to high school, doesn't go to college, um, and then their education, uh, their marital prospects, um, and their work choices, as well as their income, can sort of stay the same. And that means that there is higher consistency. When there's higher consistency across all of your factors, including education, um, your choice in mates, all of that stuff, then, then there is less of a likelihood of mobility. And if you have a lower consistency, then that means that you are able to be a little bit flexible about things. However, having some inconsistencies and having discrepancies can also lead to a form of frustration. Um, and how, how might this be the case? You may be, perhaps, um, let's say an African-American woman who goes to high school and goes to college and perhaps she she enters um, an Ivy League school, right? However, um, because of this sort of high status of education, she may still find that she is treated differently because of her status as either a woman, as an African American, or in general as an African American woman, which may lead to her not necessarily being able to get jobs that are consistent with her Harvard degree, right? So if you have this kind of low status consistency, um, then you may actually end up leading to significant amounts of frustration and you will play to the parts of your status that will sort of get you the best result. So this is a person that might choose instead of kind of focusing on her race or her gender, she will try to play up her Harvard education as much as possible in order to get ahead in life. Make sense? So let's look at the way that we divide our classes here in the US. So first let's start with the upper class. Um, we have a picture here of, of Paris Hilton <laughs> as a, in, in, in what is what can be presumed to be a private jet, as, as an example of the upper class. In the US, what defines the upper class is they're usually part of 1% of the population and they own a third of the country's wealth. Now there is a difference in the upper class between what can be considered old money and what is new money. Um, Paris Hilton can be considered an example of old money because the name Hilton has been around for generations upon generations. Um, there are, you know, Hilton hotels, and that's, you know, those are the, the hotels that bear her last name are pretty much the source of her, of her wealth. That makes her old money. New money, on the other hand, might be someone like an entrepreneur who has, like, a Silicon Valley startup that um, maybe the person who um, started... Google, or the person who started Amazon, or the person who, um, I don't know, the, the, the creator of Flappy Bird, right? So anybody who can sort of work their way up into great amounts of wealth, those are considered, those kinds of people are considered to be new money. They're all members of the upper class, but there are distinctions to be made between wealth that is inherited and wealth that is created. Now, the middle class is sort of the, the quote-unquote average American. And here we sort of have two examples of your typical middle-class American family. And uh, both of these families um, are, are similar in the sense that they have a quote-unquote traditional family structure. There are a couple of parents, few kids, um, they have pets, they own a home, and engage in all sorts of different kinds of funny adventures, <laughs> as all middle-class American families do. And even within this class, there are divisions. And there is the upper middle class, which lives very, very comfortably, and it's up to about $150,000 a year in terms of income. These are people that would be your upper management level types. 
Um, they may not be the president or the CEO of a company, but they are very, very close. They may not be the president, they might be the vice president of, of a major corporation. And these people live very, very comfortably. They can afford to take vacations whenever they can. Um, they can afford maybe one house, maybe several. Um, these people are very, very secure in their positions. On the other hand, there is the lower middle class, which are usually the people that are working for the upper middle class. Um, their incomes are not as great. Perhaps these may be people that, rather than own, maybe they rent. Uh, they, they rent their homes, perhaps. Um, these might be administrative staff, but on a sort of lower rung of administrative staff. And they have a very loose grip on this class status. While the upper middle class person is very, very likely to stay in that particular class um, and can feel very, very secure, on the other hand, it may be the lower middle class people that tend to go first when there are things like layoffs and downsizing in companies. Those people are, are typically the ones that end up kind of suffering the results of those. So it is very, very easy for a lower middle class person to engage in what is called class slippage, where they can actually slip to a lower rung because of some sort of maybe reorganization of their company, for example. Then we have the lower class, and then within the lower class there are some divisions. Uh, this is a picture of, of a family from the Great Depression. Um, we have the working class, and typically when we think of working class people, those are people that might engage in jobs such as custodial or food service people. Then there are the working poor, which kind of string together um, part-time work, seasonal work, um, they maybe rely on temp agencies to place them in all sorts of different odd jobs. And then there is the underclass, which is the either the underemployed or the completely unemployed altogether. So working class people might have full-time jobs, but these full-time jobs may not necessarily have any kind of prestige. For the working poor, they do not have full-time jobs necessarily, nor the benefits that usually come with full-time jobs like health benefits and the like. And they're kind of having to string together uh, a lot of their employment together just to make ends meet. People that are from the underclass are not making ends meet at all. Um, in fact, they do not have enough work or they just do not have any work at all. Now, because of the way that our particular open system is set up, there is a possibility for social mobility, not for everyone, of course, and it depends on, a, on, a, on a, all sorts of different factors inherent in that, but there is a certain amount of social mobility that can be afforded to certain groups of people. And what is social mobility? That is the ability to move up or down within this particular social stratification system. There is upward mobility, where you move on up, or there is downward mobility, where you can sort of slip downward. Um, then there are different kinds of mobility, um, especially when you consider that, you know, at this very moment, as perhaps high school slash college students, um, your class is kind of not of your own achievement, it's usually of your parents doing, right? You're sort of born into whatever class you're currently in now. But uh, there is intergenerational mobility, where between generations of a family, a family can sort of move either up or down in the ranks. So let's say that, that your parents um, are perhaps middle class, uh, lower middle class folks, but because of this stellar education you're getting, and perhaps you were going to be the one that, that invents um, the next great thing, uh, and, and perhaps that makes you a member of the upper middle class, or maybe even all the way up to the tippy top of the upper class, right? That would be called intergenerational mobility because you move up between generations of a family. Then there is such a thing as intragenerational family, where different members of the same generation 
might move sort of up and down. So as an example, perhaps um, you are of the lower middle class and your sibling is also a member of the lower middle class. Perhaps this lower middle class person decides that maybe they want to be a freelance artist and because of that maybe they stay within the uh, within the lower middle class and or maybe even perhaps the working class um, in order to sort of support their their art career, right? Um, on the other hand, um, you uh, might have that education, might have that extra degree, might invent the next best thing or perhaps work your way up in some sort of corporation and work your way up to say CEO, right? So the difference between you and your sibling, you are of the same generation, that would be intragenerational. So inter, between different generations of a family and intra, between different members of the same generation. So finally, um, we will talk about some class traits. When we automatically think about upper, middle, and lower class, I imagine that you probably already had some maybe examples in your head of people that might exhibit um, any kind of what are called class traits. These are typical behaviors, customs, or norms that define each class. As soon as I say upper class, middle class, and lower class, you might have pictures in your head of the kinds of people that might inhabit such a thing. Now, these are not necessarily set in stone, um, but there are some sort of common distinctions perhaps between class. So let's take our upper class example, Paris Hilton, right? Um, upper class uh, people um, may generally re um, consume um, luxury items, they might be fans of major brand names, major designers in clothing and jewelry and transportation, etc. Um, upper class people may be seen to have some sort of manners, um, they might be fond of etiquette, etc. However, someone like Paris Hilton, who is a member of the upper class, actually, perhaps, according to some people, may not necessarily show uh, some of the class traits of an upper class person, including, you know, she has a DJ career. <laughs> she has a career as a music DJ in, in various clubs and gets, um, she gets paid lots of money to, to DJ at clubs. Some people may not necessarily think that this is a, a class trait, um, or rather, she's not necessarily embodying all of the class traits that some people might think of as, as an upper class, a member of the 1%. But over the decades, um, class distinctions and class traits have blurred, um, particularly in Miami, just because of, you know, sort of our attitude of kind of sun and fun, etc. You might have somebody that is an upper class person in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and sandals, right? Because it's, it's Miami. Um, so over the decades, there may be some sort of blurred traits. Here we have a picture of, of Honey Boo Boo and, and her family. Um, and her show is sort of famous for kind of depicting, quote unquote, depicting what some may consider class traits of a lower class family, where it is that they live, the kinds of behaviors that they exhibit, all the burping and fun bodily noises, uh, the kinds of food they eat, etc. Um, however, um, they are getting paid a lot of money to be on that TV show, right? So even though they might quote-unquote exhibit the class traits of perhaps a lower class family, on the other hand, they are making the kind of income that would actually put them perhaps in upper middle class um, in, in, the, in the sort of upper middle class range, right? Um, so it's kind of interesting to consider what it is and, and sort of the ways in which class doesn't necessarily link to only economics, but it also is very, very closely related to social behaviors, both verbal and nonverbal. So 
Um, hope you enjoyed our sort of look at the divisions of, um, of our society and looking forward to checking out your discussions on the topic.